The story I'm about to tell you relates to one of David's mighty men. Now, what is interesting to me is that to no fault of David, all he did was what the Lord told him to do. And you know, sometimes you're going to do what God tells you to do, and you're going to wind up in a world of trouble for doing it. Come on now. A lot of times you get in problems not because you've done something wrong, but because you've done something right. Did you hear me? You know, since problems are going to come either way, you might as well do the right thing. Come on. You know, I made my mind up a long time ago. Somebody is going to talk about the loser, and somebody's going to talk about the winner. Since you're going to get talked about, you might as well win. Amen. And I just want to tell you that David heard from God, and he saw that Goliath was blaspheming this uncircumcised, un, a man that was not in God's covenant, had the audacity to come and blaspheme the mighty God and blaspheme God's armies. And when he pulled up with the happy meal for his brothers, as God and his, and his dad had told him to do, um, he heard that this giant was talking against God. He said, why doesn't anybody fight him? And as you know, he, in, in 1 Samuel 17, took out Goliath in, in no uncertain terms. Can you shout amen about that? Cut off his head, decapitated him, let him know that he, as God, was on the throne. Now listen to me. Because of that, jealousy rose up in the king's heart, Saul. He heard the gal singing one time as they returned home from war. Yes, Saul has slain his thousands, but David is ten thousands. And 21 times later, Saul would attempt David's life to take him out. It was in such a moment that David went into a cave. And in that cave, there were several hundreds of men followed him into that cave. And here's a lesson I want to say to you. You're going to do the right thing, and you're going to find yourself in a cave, and you have an opportunity in a dark place. Some of you are in struggling mode right now. I said you're in struggling mode here today. Something's going on in your life that's not of your choosing. Something's happening in you. Something's going on that you do not like, you did not pick, you did not desire. And so you find yourself in a cave. I remember preaching to you a long time ago how to behave in a cave. Come on, somebody. And so David brought in these men, and they began to take over quite a bit of 1 Samuel as well as Second Chronicles, these men and their stories begin to be put into God's eternal record. These are men that set the example of what can happen to you when you find yourself in a position that you did not choose. Now, let me tell you something. These men, the Bible specifically says, were a bunch of misfits. They were losers. They were nobodies. Um, they went to a cave, they were discontented, they were in debt, they were distressed. Uh, nothing good was going on in their life. And they found themselves in the proximity of a giant killer. Are you hearing me on this snowy Sunday morning, somebody? And they got in with a giant killer. How much of my time is spent telling you? We talked about it at the men's breakfast yesterday, but how much of my time is spent telling you you surround yourself with the kind of people you want to become? Come on now. You put yourself in the position where you only allow certain types of people to speak into your life. We call that advice. We call that counsel. You do not walk in ungodly counsel or you cannot be happy, Psalm 1. one. So what you've got to decide, and here's what I decided a long time ago. Not every decision I've ever made has been great, but this has been a great one. I only allow awesome, great winners to speak into my life. I am not interested in what people that are not serving Jesus have to say about anything. They do not get a vote in my life. If they're not going to heaven, they've got nothing for me. Come on now. And if they're on their way to hell, and if Jesus is not their Lord, I am not a bit interested. My dad would say one iota. I am not one iota interested in what they have to say because they are still in their foolish, dark heart. Come on now, somebody. So if you really want to have a great year, you've got to get the lighthouse. You've got to let me, you've got to let the leadership, you've got to let the ministers, you've got to let the atmosphere, you've got to let the worship, you've got to get your kids in Pastor Josh's ministry, you've got to get your youth in Pastor Dylan's ministry. What a great youth pastor we have here. 
35 kids here overnight, and there was a day, there was a day, and I, you know, we always, in our situation, I want to speak into Pastor Dylan, because in our setting, he's the worship leader, but he's also an awesome youth pastor, and he oversaw, come on somebody, you know, I slept all night that night, I wasn't worried about my youth pastor being over there doing something stupid, and acting up, and doing something crazy, he probably did something a little crazy, but nothing that would compromise the ministry. And not every pastor has that luxury of knowing their youth pastor is sold out for the Lord and will operate in godly wisdom. So, Pastor Dylan, I love you. And you need to get your youth into a man that says, I know what it's like to be married a virgin. I know what it's like to not smoke. I know what's not like to not drink. I know what's like to have a boring testimony. You need to get your children, and you know, they got all kinds of people speaking in their lives. Coaches cussing, coaches acting like a fool, and teachers, and all kinds of lifestyles influencing your children. Get your kids in the influence of men of God and women of God. Come on, somebody. Somebody that killed a giant is who I'm interested in talking to. I'm not interested in somebody's drama and somebody's business and all of their uh, nonsense. I want to know, did you kill a giant? And if you did, I'm coming to the cave with you. Come on now. Woo! He begins to list, and there are 30 of these mighty men specifically. 300 come in, but about a tenth of them, their names are mentioned and their exploits. Shammah, Eliezer, Adino, those are the top three. But then in our text today... Over, I want to talk to you about another mighty man. He did not attain to the three, but he was a great one, and his name was Benaiah. And I want to look at First Chronicles and chapter 11, verse 24. And these things Benaiah, the son of Jehodiah, did. And he won a name among the three mighty. Indeed, he was more honorable than the 30, but he did not attain to the first three. And David appointed him over his guard. So we know a couple things right now in verse 24. That he was honored by David, and he was appointed over his guard. Now let's look at verse 23. And he killed an Egyptian. Back up one. A man of great height, five cubits, somewhere between seven and ten feet tall. And in the Egyptian's hand was this amazing spear weighing about 100 to 120 pounds. It was made of a weaver's beam. And he went down into him with his staff. In other words, it's kind of a David and Goliath scenario. He was out-equipped. He just had a wooden staff, and this giant had this great, amazing, incredible, handcrafted, no doubt made and just for just for him spear. You know, if you're a bull, if you're a bowler, we got any bowlers here? Bowlers? Is that am I saying it right? Bowlers. How many like bowling? Okay, how many don't like bowling, but you bowled? Okay, if you don't like bowling and you're like me, you have never went into the bowling shop and had them drill the finger holes just for you, right? But if you're a good bowler, you've had a custom-made bowling ball. How many of you got your own? Come on now, brag about it. You got your own custom-made bowling ball. Look at that. Mary Grimes has, (laughs) Annette, you have your own custom-made bowling ball? Is it pink with little zigglies on it? It's blue. It's grill. It's drill. Oh, look, she knows. And I can see, I can see this Egyptian giant walk into the spear store and saying, I am a giant and I'm a mighty man. I don't want just some Walmart spear. I want a weaver spear. I want something that's awesome, and I want it bigger than any other spear because I'm going to intimidate. I'm going to walk out and say, ooh. And I'm going to walk out and say, ooh, and scare everybody. So here's this Egyptian giant with his custom-made spear and little Obaniah with a little wooden staff. And the, and the Bible says that Benaiah went down and he wrestled the spear out of his hand and he killed him with his own custom-made, tailor-made, non-generic, non-Walmart spear that he was made just for him in the spear store. Come on, somebody. 
I mean, he wasn't like these bowlers like you and me. We walk in, and we go through all the racks, all the scruffy little black balls, and we try to put our fingers in. We're not even wanting to be there anyhow, but someone asks us to go bowling. And we know, no, we know why they're going. You know, we know why they ask us because they're going to get a 186 and we're going to get an 83. So they ask us to make us feel good about themselves. I know you bowlers do that. I know. Uh, and so here we are. But no, no, he had his own custom made spear. But I love what the man of God did. He took that man's spear and he thrust it into him. And he killed him with the very thing he was so proud of. Oh, that's preaching right there. Because I will tell you, the thing people are proud of is what, the, what God will use against them to bring them down. Come on, somebody. All these agendas, all these voices that seem to be so boastful and, br- and proud and, 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 and bold and courageous, and they seem to be running everything, it will be to their demise. You mark my words, it will be the very thing that brings them to destruction. Because when you think you stand, take heed lest you fall. Now, are you glad you're here? And then go to verse 22. Here's the other description. Benaiah's name means son of the Lord. You also read about him in 2 Samuel 23. And he was the son of Jodiah, the son of a valiant man from Kabzeel, who had done many deeds. He had killed two lion-like heroes of Moab. <laughs> here's what he did, and here's what I want to bring to you today. He also had gone down and killed a lion in the midst of a pit on a snowy day. I don't need to tell you, but this is a snowy day. I don't often quote Dwayne Harder. I'm pretty smart. I don't do that. But I'm quoting you. You, you, you sitting down, Dwayne? I'm quoting you. You just talked yesterday about all these forecasts. And you know it's crazy because a lot of people aren't here today, and I'm not mad at anybody, but a lot of people aren't here just because of the forecast, just because of what the television said, just because of what the newscast said, just because there's somebody on the screen going. And every time we watch Indianapolis News, they stand right in front of Richmond. So Kathy goes, is that 8 inches of snow or is it 18 inches of snow? Is it 1? And, we, and we're saying, move over. We don't know how much snow we're getting. Move. We know about Kokomo, we know about Columbus, we know about Terre Haute, we know about Greenfield and Indianapolis, and they're just looking at that screen. It is pretty impressive because they really don't have it right behind them. They're over there looking at it. you all know that? It's just a green screen they're standing, and the real thing is there. So they point right to Chicago, and they actually hit it. you got to be impressed. They don't know what they're talking about, but that's a pretty good move. But what Dwayne said, here's how I, here's how I decide if I go out or not. Here's what he said. Are you right? Dwayne Harder said this. That's D-W-A-Y-N-E, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he said, here's what I do. I look out the window. Woo! Profound. That's all, that's all we're getting. When, oh, I didn't expect that much, but praise God. When I listen to me, listen to me. This is a snowy day. And as I begin to have faith, I said to my wife, I said, I've got faith. Not that many, not that many people are going to come. And I told the deacons, I said, I'm a man of faith. We're going to have just a few there. I'm a man of faith. But here's the point I didn't end up saying. I hope we can have church. I hope we can have church at all. I just hope we're able to open the doors and have a few people venture out. And I'm glad you ventured out. I feel God's power here because here's what's what going to happen. We <laughs> We are about to go down into the pit on a snowy day. And some of you have a lion that's growling and roaring and intimidating you. Did you read that 1 Peter 5 and 7 says, Therefore, casting all your cares on Jesus, for he cares for you. The next verse says, Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary, the devil, Satan, is like a what? 
a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I got news for that lion today. We're going to be like one of David's mighty men, Benaiah, and we're going to down into the pit on a snowy day, and we're going to get our hands on you for the same power that raised up Christ from the dead dwells in us, and we're going to put our hands all over the mane and the throat of that nasty lion lion, and we're going to take him and rent him asunder for the glory of God. Jump your feet and get ready to work on a snowy day. Hallelujah. Woo! Oh, give the Lord a shout. I just want you to remain standing for a moment because I want to talk to you about the lion that's been speaking to you. Some of you have heard the financial lion roar. You've heard the marriage lion roar. You've heard the work situation roar. Some of you sitting here today wondering, will this happen? Will that happen? You've heard the voice of fear and the voice of anxiety and the voice of pressure, and it's roaring. And you say, well, what do I do on a snowy day? I'm going to tell you what you're going to do on a snowy day. You're going to go down in the pit on a snowy day, and you're going to put those hands that are covered by the blood of Jesus on the throat and on the lie and on the deception of that lion, and you're going to smite him down, and you're going to exercise godly authority over him. For it wasn't by this man's might, it wasn't by his power, but it was by God's spirit. That same spirit that got into the stone of David out of that sling from that teenager and took out giant Goliath from Gath is the same, same power and the same synergy and the same spirit that got into that man that he said, I'm going to take the spear of this Egyptian giant and slay him with his own spear and I'm going to go down into the pit on a snowy day and I'm going to smite the lion that same power is resident in us today God's power has not failed it has not changed and you need to step into it in authority today hallelujah my God he called throw your hands up and talk in the Holy Ghost with me in the name of Jesus on a snowy day we win on a snowy day we conquer on a snowy day we prevail on a snowy day we triumph hallelujah hallelujah Hallelujah. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God. Now listen, here are Ephesians 6 and 10. That says, be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. And in the power of His might. Be strong in the Lord. And in the power of His might. Here, Daniel eleven thirty two, they who know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Serving Jesus is not a ritual. It's not a religion. It's about people who have connected and have got in to the heart of a mighty, undefeated God, and we win in life. You don't have to continue being tormented with the thought ever again that whatever's facing you will conquer you. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. I'm telling you, that's not what is going to happen. Whatever you are up against, you are up against on design so you can once again prove how mighty your God is. God put you in that snowy day in that pit with that line. God let that happen. To prove that he will not fail you. It's a test. It's a test. He puts you through these tests so you can get a testimony. Otherwise, you just have a money. Come on now. If there ain't no test, there's just a money. Everybody wants a testimony, but without the test. This is your test. That checkbook that's getting really, really slim, that, that cupboard that's getting bare, that phone that's not ringing, or the phone that did ring. That struggle in your relationships, these are God's opportunities, and He's allowing you to walk through these things with His enabled power to prove He is God. Listen, if it's all sunshine and sandy beaches, 
we just sit around and drink lemonade and, and do the maraca. No, no, not the maraca. Macarena. The macaroni. <laughs> uh, and we just, you know, we sip lemonades and we just, you know, we just put on suntan lotion and wear our shades and act cool and swim. We need a snowy day to prove who God is. It's not always going to be sunshine. Seasons will change. <laughs> but let me tell you something. You are going to pass this test. When that giant comes with his custom-made spear made from the spear shop, tries to intimidate you, you're going to snatch that spear from his hand and stab him in the gut with it. And when that lion comes at you in the pit on a snowy day, you're going to grit a hold of that lion, and you're going to it, tear it apart. And we're going to do some lion rending today. How many can say, in no uncertain terms, you started off these first five days of 2014 in real, in real victory, in real victory. Where are you? In real victory. I'm counting. <laughs> I'm counting about 40, about 30% of us. If your hand is not raised, I want you to walk quickly into this altar. There's been defeat. There's been struggle. That's what you're saying. There's been care. There's been worry. Problems. You haven't had real peace. That's what you're saying. Otherwise, you'd had real victory. I get you in the second part and come over here so we just have a single file we are going to kill a lion on a snowy day well, that's what we're going to do <laughs> I love the promise that says no weapon not one not one weapon fashioned against you can stand. No attempt of the enemy formed against you can prosper. So we need to be encouraged. Oh, come on now. All of you that got victory, I want you to stand. Get behind them and stand quickly. We're going to fill this altar. Either those that are, have the victory and those about to get the victory. That's all that's going We're all going to leave out here victory. We either brought it in with us or we're taking it out with us. But well, every last living one of us, you didn't come to church on a snowy day to have an average encounter with God. You came to touch God. Hallelujah. Woo. My Lord, my God, and my King. Before we pray, when you look up here, the same storm that can be an excuse to do nothing can also be an opportunity. One time, a winter or two ago, a young man struggling in a lot of areas, one came and he just went. He wanted me to give him some money. And I said, I could probably give you some money, but it'd only be 30 or 40 bucks. You probably, I could probably hook you up with three or 400 if you want. Which would you choose? Well, he said, well, I, he said, well, I'll take the three or 400. So I went out of my office in the closet and I got a snow shovel. And I said, there you go. In this tool lays about three or four hundred dollars of possibility right there. And he looked at it like that's the first time you'd ever seen one of those contraptions. He said, Pastor, what am I going to do? I said, you're going to go and you're going to knock on people's door and you're going to ask to shovel their snow. And if you get about 40 people to give you ten dollars, you know, all of a sudden that 20 or 30 bucks I was about to give him started looking a lot better. Some people find a snowy day an excuse to do nothing. 
but it can also be an opportunity. Today, we're putting a shovel in your hands. Are you going to just settle for just the easy route? Or are you going to go to digging? Come on now. Are you going to put some effort into this? Because a lot of times we call for altar calls and people stand there like, okay, Kathy, come. Okay, Pastor, come. Somebody just come and do something for me. Just slap a little oil on me and make me completely well. I mean, fix everything in a few moments. I'd like for you to act like you've got to go into the snowy pit and you've got to take care of the line for you. I don't mind praying for you. I love doing it. But the deal is, it's your victory. It's up to you. I, I, however as much I want it for you, the onus is on you. You've got to decide. Am I going to remain the same? Am I going to just settle? Or am I going to get down on a snowy day and seize my opportunity? Hallelujah. Well, I could keep preaching, but I, I, I'm not going to. Are you ready? You on the front line, I want you to lift your hands, and I want you to start telling the enemy, I'm taking back everything you've got. Every, come on now. And all of you in the back, I want you to lay your hands on these folks, and I want you to pray over them with authority.